Still fine. Uh, so I'm Andy Slocum. Uh, I actually live in Michigan. Uh, Ryan wanted me to come down here and give this talk. Um, and so I'm pretty excited to do it. Uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, it's actually 550 a day. I went back and did the math. Uh, so I'll give you guys a discount. Uh, so what, it, it, this talk is really about um, when you have a website, you're trying to get it to perform. You, have, you don't have a lot of, maybe you don't have a lot of time, don't have a lot of money. Um, so you're trying to be really efficient about how you're getting your Rails site up and running. Uh, we've been doing this uh, mostly around uh, activism, trying to get online activism brought up into sort of a more modern era. Um, activism and organizing right now is done still very much by you know, boots on the ground. People have a national network of professional organizers that like, you know, if you want to you know, unionize or you want to have some um, protests, these things are still done very sort of hierarchically um, through big organizations. And so one of my passions is trying to figure out how to turn this into something that's really a uh, you know, modern sort of internet driven thing where people can themselves you know, sort of self-organize uh, and whoop, don't step on that, okay. Uh, so we, so we, we have very, you know, so very low budgets when we're working on this. We don't have um, a lot of time. We don't always know what we're developing because uh, national groups will sort of change their mind at the last minute. So we have to do things very efficiently. Um, also, uh, a lot of uh, organizing has to happen very spur of the moment. So a great example is Ferguson. Uh, people wanted to have, you know, uh, national protests just days after that event. Um, but how do you organize a nation to, to have people show up in front of federal buildings you know, all around the country? Um, you need to be able to move very quickly. Uh, so efficiency, again, is, is really important. Um, so this talk, I mean, I, I think it, it applies very well for not-for-profits um, and maybe startups. But I mean, I, I think the, some of the lessons can apply to you know, even, even sort of bigger, bigger applications. Uh, so I'm going to talk about organizing. I have done a little bit, but I'll talk a little bit more about how online organizing usually works. Talk about this particular project where we started, where, where some of these ideas came from. Um, scaling was a big deal. What was the architecture we picked? Uh, what sort of problems, you know, good things and bad things that happened from that? Uh, and then talk about some things that have happened since then. Um, this all sort of came about last December, uh, and we've had a couple of new um, projects since then. So I can talk about some of the newer things we've been doing to try and get even more uh, performance out of a site for even less money. So. Like I said, traditional organizing, you've got boots on the ground, you have a national network of people, um, and they're full-time organizers and they know how to do this stuff. When you're doing online organizing, it's basically all about email, your email list. So you have somebody like change.org or you have somebody like um, move on. They want to organize you know, their people to show up at an event, uh, give money, whatever it is. Um, they basically, they have these big email, uh, email lists and that's why they're so sort of effective. Uh, and the rule of thumb we found on o with online organizing is for every thousand emails you, you send out, you might get 100 people who are going to actually open the email. You might get 10 people from that. They're going to actually click on the link that you send them. And out of that, you might get one person who actually you know, sort of reads your call to action, believes in it, and says, you know, yes, I want to help out. Um, so that means if you want to get 1,000 people nationwide, you need to send out a million emails to get that kind of participation. Um, and that's pretty daunting. Um, for comparison, uh, Obama's email list, which is like probably one of the best sort of online organizing uh, lists, has about 16 million people. So that's, I mean, that's, and that's something that people are very passionate about. You know you're gonna get a greater uh, response rate. So that's sort of like the high water mark. So if you're gonna or organize something online, you have to be sort of real, real serious about how many emails you really think you can send out and what kind of response you're really going to get from that. So the project we were working on uh, was actually the, uh, with the, the fast food strikes that have been going on, uh, trying to get the minimum wage raised to $15 an hour. Um, it was sort of an experimental thing. Uh, there's uh, a union called the Service and Entertainment Industry Union that is trying to help these fast food people organize. Um, they we sort of had these ideas, we had some connections, we thought, you know, let's see if we can build you guys a site to help you with these, these, these uh, sort of protests or walkouts that you're, that you're organizing. Um, but we didn't have a formal relationship, so we said, okay, we're going to build this thing, 
sort of no promises, but we're going to see what it's like. And if you guys like it, you know, you can use it for, for your campaign. Um, we knew that, that the union would be able to send out some emails to draw people into the site. We knew that uh, some, other, some other activist groups would be participating. Um, so we were trying, and what we were trying to build was a site that would get people to um, attend rallies. This was last, uh, last December. And the idea was to get people to find rallies, attend them, ideally sign up and help, uh, you know, help organize. So it may mean call your newspaper. It may mean um, uh, print out some flyers. It may mean you know, bring some giant sheets of paper so you can write some slogans you know, and, and have, you know, have stuff when people show up. They can walk around and hold up, hold up cards. Um, so the SEIU organized some cities and they said, okay, here's all the other cities we don't, we think there might be interest, but we don't have time to organize this sort of next tier of cities. So, you know, put those up on your site, uh, see if you can get people to show up. Um, and like I said, this was not really an official thing. So we were doing it just hoping that we could learn something about how, how online organizing works. Um, so what we had was sort of this landing, this is like the landing screen. Uh, you could put in your zip code and hit search, uh, and it would take you to this page that would show you any any local or any rallies sort of anywhere near you. It was actually like 200 miles, which is an incredible amount of distance to drive to stand around for an hour. Uh, but we were pretty sure that's what we wanted. So you could it would sort of show you the nearby events. You could click and attend, and you could put your email address in and say, "Okay, I'm going to be there." You know, give me updates. Uh, told you where to go, sort of what what time. Uh, and then you could also optionally sort of say, you know what, I actually want to help out. And then that would get you into sort of a more um, engaged role where you could, uh, you know, like I said, you could call the newspaper, you could be the media contact, you could be the uh, person giving directions, giving rides to people. Uh, and so we thought that'd be a great way to let people sort of come up around this issue and, and, and sort of self-organize without requiring, you know, so much overhead. Um, the biggest concern, so this was, this was basically a one-day protest for like an hour, two hours, uh, and the way that they wanted to run it is they wanted to not launch it until, even mention it until Monday, and the rally was going to be on a Thursday. So they didn't want, basically, I don't really know what their motivation was, but it, it was along the lines of they were worried that if you announce it too soon, then, you know, opponents, you know, even McDonald's corporate might try and disrupt things. So it was sort of like doing a big bang, get everybody excited all at once, have this rally. So we expected sort of zero traffic until the week of the event, uh, and then a huge amount of traffic, and then nothing again. So this isn't sort of your standard like, you know, launched, soft launch to a couple of users and ramp it up. It was like everything and then nothing. Uh, so just about two months before that, uh, healthcare.gov launched. Uh, so our big fear was, uh, don't let this be like healthcare.gov. You know, we don't want to have people coming to this website and getting, you know, 404s or whatever. Uh, so that was literally like the, the guy, the, the product owner was like, this cannot happen. You have to figure out how to scale, but we don't know how many people are coming to the site. We don't know how popular it's going to be, but it could be big. So scale it up as big as you can. Uh, and by the way, we don't have a budget. Um, so try not to spend a lot of money. Uh, so what we ended up with, based on what we understood at the time, uh, we had Ruby 2 and Rails 4. Uh, we decided to go with Mongo um, because it seemed like it had good performance. It seemed, you know, frankly, it was kind of cool and we wanted to try it out. Uh, what we ended up doing was using SnapCI to do, with GitHub, to sort of do an automatic push into Heroku. Uh, we used Amazon CloudFront to serve all of our static assets. Uh, and then we had Memcache for some of the stuff in Mongo and then Mailgun, you know, so we could send out emails to people. Um, what else is on here that's interesting? OmniAuth, so you could log in through Facebook if you wanted. Um, New Relic, Google Analytics, keep an eye on, on everything. Uh, Gatling is a really cool, uh, I think it's a Scala-based performance testing tool, um, just so I could get some sense of what the load was going to look like. Um, the interesting thing about using Puma uh, in Heroku is it sort of lets you do multi-threaded Rails apps. Um, it, you have to be careful about how you code, and you have to be sure you're not using too, many, you know, global, too much global state, or you're doing it safely anyway. Uh, but you can actually get multiple, multiple threads in one Rails process. 
Uh, and so that can give you a real, you know, really a huge performance boost uh, for, you know, the same sort of, uh, you know, VM size. Uh, we picked memcache. The neat thing about memcache uh, on Heroku is the 25 meg instance was free, uh, so we use that. Um, New Relic is pretty great at a free level. Google Analytics is free. Uh, Amazon CloudFront was, uh, it costs something like 12 cents per gigabyte of, of traffic that you're, that you're transferring. Um, cheap enough, uh, and that got all of our, um, you know, serving of, of JavaScript and images and stuff out of, out of Heroku, which gives you also a very huge uh, performance. It was totally worth it. Uh, so in terms of performance tuning, um, I had a really simple, simple script. So since um, you know that you're going to have a lot of people sort of hitting the home page, but probably not a lot of people clicking beyond that, what you want to do is optimize your home page as much as you can. Keep it as simple as you can so you, know, so you can see there's literally just one thing you can interact with um, so that it's just so easy to do. Uh, we didn't, I guess we could have gotten into geocoding um, that was beyond the amount of time, and actually, I think I just thought of that. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm going to put that on my list. Uh, that would have been smart. Um, so, yeah, so I was trying to optimize just a, a sort of a, a very shallow path through the application, and we figured if anybody actually is going to engage, maybe we can afford a little bit worse performance for that. Um, so we, I started out looking at, okay, so one, one, Pretty good uh, 2x dynos. So that's like the bigger the bigger box on Heroku. 100 users um, doing zip code searches. Basically, was all it was. Pick you know a bunch of random zip codes and search. Um, pretty good pretty good behavior. But we can only we were sort of topping out at like 30 30 requests per second uh, before you know that was sort of what we we're getting. It didn't seem like it was saturated. When we bumped that up to 500 simultaneous users, we started getting a ton of errors. Um, and then these response times are in milliseconds, so this is like four seconds for a page to load. 95% of the users were getting it under 30 seconds. This is getting pretty awful. Um, 57 requests per second. And we sort of saw that like, that seemed like sort of a high, a high limit. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't get any more performance out of than that uh, for what we're doing, which was zip code would do a geocoded lookup to find all the zip codes nearby where there might be events and return those to you. Um, just couldn't, couldn't beat that, and that's, I mean, that's terrible, right? Uh, so try and scale up to five dinos. Okay, well, what we found out was it really wasn't getting any better. So even with five boxes, 500 users, fewer errors, but still the same awful performance numbers uh, in terms of page load times. Um, so then clearly the problem is getting to be in the database uh, and doing the GeoNear lookup. Um, so then we started, try, started trying some things with caching. Uh, so take all of your zip code results and cache them. Uh, and what I thought was, on one hand, I was thinking, well, you know what, let's be smart about this and let's do it the sort of Railsy way, which is, you know, load the object and then cache it when it's loaded. Um, starting from a cold, sort of cold cache, you would have not too many errors. Um, performance was, yeah, really no better. Um, but what, what I finally settled on was, let's cache every zip code in the country on startup. So there's 49,000 zip codes in the country. Um, because it's really just a small amount of data, uh, zip code and coordinates, uh, and then maybe the, the, the references to the search results, uh, you can fit all of that in 25 megabytes. Uh, then what we found was the performance was really not too bad. Um, if we really had 500 users simultaneously hitting the site, we could hit, you know, 72 per second. I mean, that, that started to seem like that was pretty good for a pretty, pretty small, you know, pretty small improvement in terms of the amount of code you have to write, which is on startup, query every zip code in the system, uh, and get them all into the cache. Uh, and that, that was probably about good enough. You know, you finally see much better numbers for 95% of your users. Uh, and that's what we ended up with, um, mostly because we ran out of time. Um, but it was, a, but it was a pretty good, uh, pretty good improvement. Finally, I think it made more difference than the number of dinos, frankly, because we were finally taking the load off of the database. Uh, and then what we actually saw uh, was 
so this is this is the Google Analytics graph. Um, this is when the campaign sort of launched in terms of uh, the organization sending out emails. Um, you had sort of spikes. This is like Monday morning, uh, you know, Tuesday morning. I guess the rally was on Wednesday or late Tuesday. Um, so you get a spike when an email is sent, another spike when another email is sent. Uh, and then the interesting thing was the day of the rally, and in retrospect, this makes perfect sense. Everybody goes and looks on their phone to see what, oh, where was this thing? How do I get there? What time is it? Uh, and so this was like, you know, an hour or two before the rally, we had this huge spike in traffic of people just sort of confirming, looking at their email again. Uh, so we ended up having a quarter of our entire traffic was in this like little three hour, yeah, three hour window. Uh, as they were like deciding for that day if they're going to show up at lunchtime or not. Um, and if anybody has questions, I'm sorry, please, please interrupt. Um, and, and on average, people were visiting for a minute. So it really ended up, what we saw was, yeah, you know, people are coming to the website, doing a zip code search, uh, and that's about it. Um, but the, the site did stay up, and then, of course, after the rally, uh, nobody cared anymore. There's no reason to go back to the site, and so it was dead again. So it ended up being a very intense burst of traffic uh, over a very short amount of time. Um, and we were coding right up sort of to the last minute for that. Um, so some of the problems that we had, uh, one, you know, Mongo, Mongo and Rails 4 as of last December, uh, the support was not great. It didn't have, you didn't have all of the gems if you'd, if, you know, if you'd gone with something like Postgres, you figure you get a, you know, a lot of sort of built-in support uh, with Rails. Mongo was not as great for that. Um, also, the data model didn't fit. We were sort of thinking initially, okay, we're going to have a rally and attendees, and so let's go with a document structure um, so that we can have everything together at once. Didn't work out. We actually, what we wanted was, you know, rallies are a thing, and then people wanted to know about attendees separately. So, in retrospect, not a great idea, but we didn't. Again, you didn't sort of know that until you're in, you know, in the live app, seeing how people are using it. Um, cache and validation. Um, uh, memcache didn't invalidate, the, didn't give me the options I wanted. I wanted to be able to say, oh, you know, one event has been updated. I want to only clear the results for all the search results around that, around that event. So I had to actually kill the whole cache and rebuild it anytime anything changed. Not ideal. It still worked. Um, I always wanted something a little more elegant than that. Uh, the functionality, so I talked about, you know, trying to get people to sign up to be, um, you know, media contacts or printing out pages or whatever. Uh, we ended up, out of everybody that went to the site, um, 25,000 visitors, we had a seven who got beyond sort of just search results. Um, which, which fits exactly that sort of order of magnitude every time, uh, reducing your, you know, your participation. Uh, but it was, pretty, it was pretty stark to see that. We felt like we built a lot of functionality for those users, uh, and we basically didn't use any of it. People were just, you know, check the site, show up, you know, protest. That they wanted to be engaged in the activism. They didn't want to be engaged in our website, um, which really hit the real goal of the website. Uh, but then we sort of realized we built all this code. We could have spent, you know, optimizing. We could have been, spent improving the UI, user experience. There's a lot of other things we could have done. Um, we had originally used Google Maps API to do the zip code lookups. Um, and what I found out when I was performance testing, uh, Google, Google API lets you for free do 25,000 lookups per day. Um, when you're performance testing, you hit that real quick, uh, particularly when you have a big you know, spreadsheet of things you're trying. Uh, so that didn't work out. So we actually had to go and find um, zip code data mapped to latitude and longitude for free, which which exists, it's downloadable, it's free, it, it works very well. Um, but you have to, you know, you have to use that. Sorry. I was gonna say, I think I might have once been involved in a project where people drove to Starbucks and kept on running the geocoding process from different IP addresses. Oh. <laughs> nice, to, to get around the limits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, um, organizations, so the organizations that, that are giving us these, these, this email traffic, um, they have a goal too, which is to make, to understand the demographic of their users and understand, you know, who's clicking on, who's clicking on the emails, who's opening them up, who's coming to our site and who's not. Uh, so we built out all this rich functionality about what they did when they got there, 
but the groups providing these, these emails wanted stats. They wanted to know, you know, which, which email do we send out that got the people to click through, um, how many users clicked through, how long did they stay. Um, so since we were reliant on them for traffic, we had to give them a lot of data back in terms of, in terms of who came and who didn't. Um, so that was actually something we should have spent a lot more time on. We spent a lot of time that week doing, you know, sort of ad hoc queries. Um, and that was sort of not understanding the, the currency of, ooh, we are still recording. Um, and then the way we were sort of organizing people, you know, pe people would agree to, to help out with, with a particular rally. And then we had some people uh, that were sort of super users that would give them advice and teach them how to, you know, what they needed to bring to a rally, what they needed to do. So they needed a much better, much better interface than we gave them as well. Um, so just, just things we didn't think about talking to our users about how they're really going to be using the site. We did some demos with people. We got, you know, my dad, who's an old hippie organizer, um, people like that to, to, you know, walk through the site and see what they thought about it. But we didn't do enough of that. We didn't do enough to really understand the users that we were, that we were um, going to have. Also, mobile, this surprised me. So a lot of our users, a lot of the people at the, at the rallies are like ex-union guys or, you know, current union guys. Maybe they're auto plant workers or, or machinists or whatever. 30% um, of our traffic was on mobile. Uh, and it was literally like, you know, these, these people that we don't think of as super technical, we think of, oh, our parents aren't, aren't really good at this internet thing. They're all using their iPhones now. Um, they're checking their mail on their iPhone. They're hitting the links on the iPhone. Um, we did not properly organize for mobile. Uh, and you couldn't, you couldn't browse the site very well on mobile because we were just assuming they were all desktop users because that's what we thought of our, sort of our parents as being. Um, that did not work out very well. We had to do some very like day of fixes so that they could actually see where, where the event was and what time it was because of how the formatting was not flowing well. Uh, things that went well, um, we ended up uh, 50, having 50 additional rallies happen uh, during that, that event in December, which I thought was pretty cool uh, for just a couple people building the site. Um, it got a little bit of news coverage. Uh, we had international visitors. Um, we saw some hits from, you know, Ireland and, and Northern Europe, and that was pretty neat. Um, we did not crash. Uh, that was great. That made me pretty happy. The, the site kept pretty decent response times um, for, the, for the whole campaign. Um, the free zip code data, which you Google like free zip code list, and you can get them for the whole world. You have to update it manually yourself if things change. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Did you end up using the GeoIP gen at all? I'm just curious because I was one of our old members actually wrote about that and used it for a similar purpose. Mm, um, you just like shove the data into the gem and it, it can do. You have the data source, so we'll talk yeah. to yeah. the yeah. API yeah. that's yep. rate limited. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it that the the GeoIP gem yeah backs into. You have to pick a provider. Yeah. We ended up using uh, Mongo has a built-in GeoNear function, which you give it coordinates and you specify are they spherical or rectangular, and it will do the do the lookup for you. The, the data set you ended up using, mm -hmm. um, I do know that there's census like post office census data from the U.S. floating around from like 2000. Right. It had pretty good coverage, but right. you know some things have changed. Sure. Sure. Um, what is this data source that you mentioned having I, more? You know, I'd have to look up what the what the URL was. Um, there was it's like an old like FTP site where you get zips. You can get zip file and per, put in your own data per country, page. and then it's just literally like a. Uh, tab limited file of zip code, city, city state, um, and coordinates. Um, yeah, so it, it worked well enough. Yeah. And, and that's awesome to have open source access to yeah, that kind of exactly. data. It's really, it's really neat to be able to get to that. Um, and the other thing was, in our case, it didn't matter too much because we, were, we had such a big search area. We were looking for anything within 200 miles of your zip code. So any changes didn't really matter. I mean, maybe like up in remote Alaska, but we didn't really think we were going to get many users from there. So, um, because it was, you know, it was a small team. Um, we had, I think I skipped that slide. Only maybe four developers. Um, a little bit of time from a uh, user experience developer. Uh, we did we did adapt quickly. Um, Snap CI. Was a great way to get you know a commit to get into production. We could we could do you know staging to certain environments before pushing to production. Um, again, it just took it. It may not be the the globally optimal solution, but it got 
it got effort off of our backs, uh, which was really the key given the short, very short time frame. Um, user experience, I thought it was really clean. I thought it was really neat, you know, that you could have just sort of one button and then get your search results without having a lot of cluttered, you know, our early UI was much worse than our final UI uh, in, terms of, in terms of things. Um, here's a picture from an actual rally. Uh, it ended up, and it was funny, we, we had uh, six people show up, including me, um, a union, uh, I think an auto worker guy, and then a couple of teachers from a teacher's union. Um, we actually had two cop cars across the street watching us, uh, making sure that we were not causing trouble. Um, and they came over and talked to us and we had to make sure not to block the McDonald's or whatever. So it, it, was, it was neat for me to actually get out and, and you know, sort of walk around in front of McDonald's. Um, I, I really thought that was a pretty neat part. Uh, in terms of costs, uh, GitHub private repo, $7 a month. Um, Heroku, we ended up with two dinos. Uh, and then the Mongo instance needed to be big enough, uh, so we had to pay for that. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of Heroku, that was really all we paid for. Uh, and then serving all of our assets through Amazon CloudFront was nine bucks uh, for 25,000 users. That seemed pretty cool. Um, Four million requests and 50 gigs of data, I mean, that was, that was a great deal. Um, if I then pretend that we got the Heroku dinos for the month, We'll call that 30 days of that, and then about seven bucks a day for Amazon. Worked out to in the neighborhood of five or six dollars a day um, to serve that much traffic when we didn't know. Now, if we knew, we could maybe optimize more closely and, and pull it down to exactly what it should be. Sorry. You, oh, I thought you had your Okay. So things we learned: mobile, mobile's first-class concern. 30% of the traffic, uh, even though it was sort of a traditional desktop app. Um, for something like this, we absolutely should have spent more time on mobile. Um, mail guns, so we were trying to send emails out to people to say, hey, by the way, your rally's you know, here's where your rally's going to be and here's where you want to go. Um, we, because of some weirdness about who was hosting the, the URL and how the CDN was working, we couldn't get that working really. Um, so that was another thing that we spent a lot of time on was sending email, trying to figure out how to send you know, big email blasts out to all the users of the site. Um, and we ended up just running out of time. They said, okay, yeah, we've got your, your DNS entry. It's going to take us three weeks to validate that. And it's like, well, we've only got a week, so so much for that. Um, organizing, you know, if, if people are driving traffic to your site, they're going to want to know how effective their campaigns were. Um, be prepared to share data. You, don't, you sort of don't get these things for free. Um, spend more time, as I said, spending more time with our users would have, would have given us, given them a much better experience and given us an easier way to, uh, you know, spend more, uh, spend our time more effectively, our limited time more effectively. Uh, performance tuning, you know, I, I tried to go the, the smart, cool, hip rails way, um, and I ended up with just sort of a brute force, like, let's just cache all the zip codes and not worry about it. And that worked so much better. Uh, I'm glad I didn't spend a lot of time trying to validate each little, you know, how do I properly invalidate the cache? I didn't have time for it. So get it good enough, uh, and it may surprise you. I mean, that, that's, that's the lesson of performance tuning always, is trying to be too clever, I think, is going to always just not work as well as trying something simple, validate it, before you try something more complicated. Uh, and then, yeah, any, any website, certainly for, for online organizing, but any startup, you want to start by, uh, you know, polish your first two pages. You're not going to really get any users beyond that. I mean, you will. You'll get a few, but you really want the the, the home page to load super fast. You know, if you have a call to action, you want that to be super quick. Uh, everything else, you know, is is you're you're hitting you know one percent of your traffic. You know, maybe less than that on these other deep cool pages that you're building. Um, so don't spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, since then, uh, we have a new, a new app that we're building. Um, this is for Friends of the Congo. Uh, we're trying a little different format here. We're doing, actually using the Google, the Google map. Um, we're hoping that it's little enough traffic that this isn't a problem. Um, this is uh, basically um, a national campaign where uh, people have events and sort of try and raise awareness about the Congo, what's happening there. Um, a lot of the issues of sort of leftover colonialism um, taking a lot of the, the natural wealth and resources of the Congo. Um, so we're working with them to try and build a new version. We actually, 
we thought, you know, we can try and reuse and adapt this code base. It's a similar thing, events, you know, over a limited week. Um, we decided, you know what, let's throw it out and start from scratch. We know what we want to build, so let's not carry this cruft of this, of this application. You know, the first app, we didn't do a lot of testing because we were, you know, go so fast, don't test. You go faster. Um, that killed us, uh, as it always does. Um, so we started from scratch, you know, good TDD design, um, keeping it light and simple, using what we learned last time to build a more appropriate architecture, use Postgres, um, you know, try a different layout. Uh, so this is version two, and I think if we have a version three, we may even throw this stuff out and try version three. Um, the idea being, if you're building these applications, um, you know, the first time you're always like, oh, you know, I wish I had known when I get to the end, I wish I had known to do this this way. I wish I had known to not use Mongo because the document structure didn't make sense. You know, throw it out and start over. You may end up going a lot faster because you're smarter now. You know what you need. It's going to be a lot easier to write the code. Um, other cool optimizations. Um, we talked about using OpenStreetMap. Um, you don't have the, any, any real limit on that, although I feel like I have a little bit of guilt. I don't want to slam OpenStreetMap because it's a you know, open source, open resource. Um, but uh, it's, another, it's another thought for getting around yet another, you know, little bit of expense. Um, New Rel this is an interesting one. So uh, Heroku, if you don't pay for a dyno, it will deactivate it, you know, it'll, it'll shut it down after, I don't know what it is, a few hours of non-use. Um, the free tier of New Relic uh, has this thing called availability monitoring. You can give it a URL and it will ping the URL for you. Um, it's kind of a hack, uh, but in terms of like, I need to get this thing to work and I want it to always be up, and it's a small instance, you know, it, it can work. Uh, the other thing is Heroku instances have a limit of 512 megabytes, and if you exceed that, they will assume it's a memory leak and they will kill your process. Uh, but if you can stay underneath that, um, Puma has options to give you, um, you can have as many threads as you want in Puma. Um, so you could have 16 threads if you want, as long as you can keep you under this memory footprint for, for one instance. So you can figure out also how to, if you know you have a lot of very easy, you know, low memory requests coming in, uh, you, can, you can have a lot more threads and get a lot more performance out of, out of one Heroku <laughs> instance that way, uh, which is a pretty neat, neat little trick. So maybe instead of me having, uh, you know, five dynos, maybe I could have done it with one or two and just use a lot more threads to get the, the higher throughput with good caching. Uh, you guys have any questions? Yep. How long did it take to warm up the cache? Uh, how long did it take to warm up the cache? Uh, the cache uh, I mean, it was, it was, you know, 49,000 zip codes uh, a minute. I don't know, nothing. I mean, it was, we, we knew all the zip codes because we had the list, so we could just literally do 49,000 lookups. Um, it was quick enough uh, that you could do it at runtime, and maybe you'd have a couple of users have some bad experience, <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't enough to even worry about. Uh, when I was listening to how you put your cash together, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you did this, I don't know. You could have measured the distance, the 200 mile distance around all your known zip code locations for your routes. Calculated all those at the beginning, put that in the cache. Right. And when a query came in, it'd be instantaneous. Yeah, we absolutely. Know the way. Yeah, we, we, I thought about that uh, because it'd be a little bit faster, right? Um, I ended up doing it the other way around um, because we didn't know if the cities would be changing. So we were kind of getting even the, the city data late and last minute. Um, so I didn't have time to do that, that sort of reverse, reverse math. But yeah, I, I, I thought about doing that. So what I did instead was just run, all my, run a, a zip code query for every zip code, which was sort of the, you know, the inverse of what you're yeah, what well, suggesting. The only, the only difference would be if you did it at the front end, there would only be a limited number of zip codes that you'd have to look at because it'd all, it'd all, yeah. it'd all be within that distance mm -hmm. test. Mm -hmm. And running those distance tests on your package of cities yeah. be very fast to begin with. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the, the other problem was 200 miles around an event is so many zip codes anyway. 
So, I mean, 200 miles for me in Ann Arbor, that was like well into Ohio. It wasn't all the way to Chicago, but it was like, you know, into, into you know, central Indiana. So that was, I, I thought about that, but then I figured, what do I get out of that math? It might even be, it was gonna be a lot of uh, duplicate zip codes and I'd have to filter that out. So yeah, I, I thought about that and then I was like, well, the amount of effort, let's just do it the other way. But yeah, that, that definitely came up, yeah. And when we talked about this Congo week, it's an international thing, so I thought, okay, maybe, maybe with that we try something like that where we, we say like, you know, do it by country or something, you know. But yeah, I agree, I, I, I thought about that. So what's your? Um, uh, so what's the performance looking like this time around? You didn't have any charts about the new stuff. Yes, uh, Congo Week is two weeks from now, so I don't know. Okay. Um, we've done some optimization on on the main pages, um, like I said, just you know one or two levels deep. But yeah, we don't we don't know yet. So I haven't done that because we're trying Google API, and I didn't want to um, kill us because I was I, I'm still unsure. They say that it's. A number of calls per day, but I feel like I was seeing like if I hit too many per hour, it would start to slow me down. So I've been I've been nervous about that for that reason. So do you think that changing the Postgres from Mongo is going to magically fix everything? It's going to be super fast now. Mm, no. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it meets our it makes our data model simpler because we're we can we can we can load just an event which is just a small number of details versus we had to load an event, we had to load all the attendees, we had to load all of the tasks for each attendee. I mean, it just, it got to be too much data per, per thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it's just, it's smaller data and so it's gonna be more efficient for that reason, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, okay, uh, so you, um, I, I think there was kind of a, a recommendation there for people mm -hmm. to kind of start with responsive UI uh, yeah. uh, on, on the website rather than like trying to bolt it on later. Right. So um, did you find any tools or libraries or anything that would help people to kind of start in that space? There, there was a framework we looked at. I can't think of the name. Um, I, can get it, I can get it to the, to the list or something later. Uh, but there, there was a framework that gave you sort of cool looking modern hip UI that was responsive, but I can't, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. We were already sort of committed to a for, you know, UI at that point, so it was more about optimizing what we had. So. Did you use any uh, geolocation stuff on the IP address that was coming to query you? Uh, I wish I had. <laughs> that, 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 um, <laughs> Yeah, oh, exactly. you'd have known when they, they were there. You'd exactly. give them an answer exactly. before they were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, so the new, I mean, the new app is sort of this more conventional. You start with a map, right? So it's sort of easier to, to I think people are easier. You know, have a better time interacting with this kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, that would have been that would have been smart. That would have been smart. Yeah. Yeah, or I can repeat, sure. He was right by the camera. <laughs> um, so Mailgun is notorious for having those problems where you have to be a known, you, known entity. Yep. Otherwise, they spam. I mean, your item's going to spam. Mm -hmm. Have you all looked into a different method of getting the communications to the people faster? Yeah, I mean, in this, in this case, we didn't have, we didn't have a better solution. Um, it was sort of a race on time at that point. We didn't we didn't realize that we would be that they would be they would own the IP, but we would be you know f forwarded to us, and it just it ended up just it was one of those like last minute maybe we can get it maybe we can get it, uh, and we couldn't. But yeah, that was yeah it it would worse than not sending emails. It would actually hang, um, and that was another problem too. If it didn't want to send your email, it would just hang the thread until it timed out, uh, and that was. That was a killer because that was 30 seconds, you know, or whatever. So we had to very quickly throw a thread in to take care of that. Cue it. Yeah. I was going to say um, maybe not so much on the instance of setting up on uh, Heroku <laughs> Dino itself, mm -hmm. but for sending emails, one of the biggest tricks I've seen is to simply have a local Postfix server that the Rails app hands off the email to and then let it worry about 
delivering to the transactional SMTP service from there. And so. Awesome. That's yeah. a great suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So Mongo has um, some of that geolocation data that you were talking about. Yeah. Did you have to do a, it, I'm not really familiar with Postgres, like the okay. newer versions. Do they have geolocation already rolled in? But because uh, I know back in the day you used to have to use like PostGIS and some of those custom compiled yeah, I, things. It, I, it does. Um, as far as I know it does, yeah. The, the details of it work, you know, it, it's sort of, it seems like it's the same interface between the two, but the details are very different. Um, it's, it's always the devil in details, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that Postgres has that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it also does apparently now does JSON. You can give it JSON data, and it can query that, which is pretty neat too. What's that? It gives you a lot of features of Mongo. Yeah, exactly. Storage, so. Exactly. Yep. Is the reason you avoided Postgres because it is expensive? Um, no, it was it was in fact just because uh, when we started the project, we thought that that fit our data model. Um, and like I said, it was a it was a three month project. So by the time we figured out it wasn't, we didn't have time uh, to to rewrite the the back end that way. All right. Oh. This is probably a really immature question. I'm more of a JavaScript programmer. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess in order to initialize the Ruby um, in the course of the HTML, I've never written a, a website in Ruby before. Mm -hmm. Do you just do um, the lesson sign RB and then um, put the source code, that, um, or I guess if you have Rails loaded on your machine, do you mm -hmm. write all the code and call in all the geolocation data in the Rails compiler? And then how do you call it back into the website? Or how do you get it to post over the internet? Uh, yeah, so it's um, it's uh, Rails handles that for you. Yeah, so it's got the the, the server running on the back end. Uh, when you make a request to the server, it's doing the call, and then it's handing off to a template that's rendering for you. Um, do you have to call in a specific library from Rails, or that's Mongo? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Rails. Yeah, we had hookups to do the the geo lookup. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Um, I'll say no. So thanks a lot. Thank thanks you. for your time. Thank you. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.